Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this week's book club. My name is Erin Aoyama, and I am absolutely delighted to introduce this week's author, Marilyn Chase. Marilyn Chase graduated from Stanford University in English Literature. After getting a master's in journalism at UC Berkeley, she worked for two decades at the Wall Street Journal as a reporter and columnist. She has taught journalism at Stanford and has been a continuing lecturer at Berkeley for 10 years. Her latest book, and so far favorite, is Everything She Touched, The Life of Ruth Asawa. Marilyn lives and shelters in place in San Francisco and is honored to be able to meet virtually with pilgrims from all over the country. So Marilyn, thank you so much for being here. We are so delighted to have you and really looking forward to hearing your presentation and then talking with you and answering some questions afterwards. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to join you today to talk about Ruth Asawa. Um, and as you say, I'm super honored to take part in the Tadaima Book Club. Uh, the Japanese American Memorial Pilgrimage and Friends of Minidoka. Special thanks to Mia Russell and Aaron Aoyama for making this happen. So uh, as your host just said, um, I'm an author who turned to writing books after working in newspaper journalism. So I'm not an art historian. I'm, I'm not a member of the Japanese American community, so I can claim no special knowledge or wisdom. I came to this project as a reporter with a beginner's mind and a big dose of humility. As a reporter, my job was to tell human stories behind the news. And so it was the human story of Ruth Asawa, really a hero's journey that I was hoping to tell. So this project began in the summer of 2014 when I read that Ruth Asawa's family had given her papers to Stanford University and that encompassed some 275 boxes of documents, letters, photos, designs. And I also consulted the National Archives, Densho Encyclopedia Online, the Roar Outpost, uh, Roar Outpost, excuse me, let me say that again, the camp newspaper called the Roar Outpost. It's kind of a tongue twister. Um, and the Roar Reunion booklets, which were extremely helpful in uh, providing cultural context and other documents, plus interviews with some 80 family, friends, colleagues, and artists, friends of Ruth Asawa's. My work took about five years, which like all passion projects, I guess, uh, passed like the blink of an eye. So it was in those archives that I first met the young Ruth Asawa, and I hope you can see this slide. Uh, it's really a charming school portrait of this very young adolescent girl on the brink of huge turbulent historic changes. She was the middle child of seven, born in 1926 to a very hardworking couple who maintained a truck farm in Los Angeles. She was raised to appreciate hard work, lending a hand to her parents' farm, planting, harvesting, creating produce for the marketplace. Ruth loved to draw, paint, sing, and dance, but at home, her energies were focused on planting onions, looping string beans on the trellis, and building the wood fire beneath the traditional bathtub, the ofuro. On Saturdays, she went to Japanese school and learned calligraphy. The impulse to make art was so strong, though she even expressed it in the fields while riding on the back of her father's truck, she would trace figure eight designs in the earth with her toes. These skills and these motifs, weaving the string beans on the trellises, the calligraphy, and these wavy figure eight designs in the soil would all inform and shape her art. But this life marked by school and seed time and harvest exploded when Pearl Harbor drew the US into World War II. After President Franklin Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, uh, the first thing that happened in her family was that Ruth's father was arrested in the fields by two FBI agents while he was tending his strawberry plants. Next, in April, Ruth, her mother, and siblings were ordered into the assembly center at San Anita Racetrack, where they had to live in a horse stall. At San Anita, Ruth, however, met three Japanese American artists, Disney studio animators, who worked on feature films like Pinocchio and Snow White. These men, Tom Okamoto, Chris Ishii, and James Tanaka 
taught drawing and perspective to Ruth and other students at the racetrack. And as working artists from the community, they of course were inspiring role models for Ruth. After six months in Santa Anita, the Sawa family along with others boarded those hot dilapidated trains for a difficult three-day journey east, ending at the prison camp in Roar, Arkansas. Everything about it, the heat, the ochre soil, the moss hanging off the trees over the bayous, seemed harsh and alien images that she saw with her young artist's eyes. Ruth said the most, most precious thing that her mother brought from home were seeds, and many pl families planted gardens in front of their barracks. Here we can see Ruth standing beside one of those trousses on which she would loop the string beans, a skill that anticipates the looped wire of her sculptures. Each is an act of drawing in space. As many of you know, Japanese families were such productive gardeners in camp that their produce not only supplemented their sort of meager and plain uh, mess, mess hall uh, dinners, but was also shared with the nearby military bases and helped to feed US soldiers. Well, while in camp, Ruth found teachers who recognized her gifts. Her art teacher, Jamie Vogel, took her students on sketching trips outside the barbed wire fence. And on one such trip, Ruth produced this watercolor of the moody bayou landscapes surrounding the barracks. Throughout the war years, Ruth found that the antidote to captivity was in creativity. And she would say of this period, art saved us. Ruth was in, uh, raised to endure hardship with patience and dignity, according to the principle of Gaman, which my friend and researcher and curator Delphine Hirasuna beautifully translates as enduring the unendurable with patience and dignity. She always seemed to find opportunity within adversity. And in fact, she would often say, if it weren't for the war, I wouldn't be who I am and I like who I am. After graduating from high school in 1943, Ruth received this ID card for indefinite leave to attend a college in the Midwest. So she set her sights on Milwaukee State Teachers College where she could study to become an art teacher for just $25 a semester. Funded by a scholarship from a Quaker benefactor and her wages as a nanny and live-in housekeeper, she plunged into her studies. But after three years of college work, racial bias barred her from becoming a student teacher. So she had to leave school without her degree or credential. Just imagine. Her school friends in Milwaukee urged her to follow them to Black Mountain College, an experimental art school in North Carolina, where pioneers of modern art, dance, and music were teaching a new generation of creative young people. Asawa found scholarship funds to cover enough for one summer session. She boarded another train and off she went on a journey that would change her life. Here you see Ruth and one of her uh, fellow students, Ora Williams at Black Mountain College in 1946, which was just about the time that she arrived in a photo by another student, Mary Parks Washington. Arriving at Black Mountain, Ruth found an exciting experimental art lab where students of all ethnicities had their own studios and learned at the hands of greats, like the painter Joseph Albers, dancer Merce Cunningham, composer John Cage, and many more. Ruth thought she would take weaving, but learned that six weeks wasn't enough to learn the craft, so instead she enrolled in color and design with Joseph Albers himself, who became her great mentor. She planned on staying for only a summer, but ended up staying for three years. And here you can see Albers, who had experienced political oppression also, having fled Germany when the Nazis closed the Bauhaus. In design class, he taught students to open their eyes and respect craft. Albers' use of Zen principles, yin and yang, in and out, light and dark, foreground and background being of equal importance in design, really resonated with young Ruth. Because of her background and work ethic, she thrived in his discipline, unlike some of her richer and more entitled classmates. Here we see another important faculty member to Ruth, Buckminster Fuller, the futurist engineer and creator of the geodesic dome. Students saw him as a kind of prophet and a kind of wizard. 
Ruth appreciated Bucky's sculptural geometry and philosophy of, of living with less and sustainability. She also became his barber. She gave him haircuts for free or for a dime donation to the school. And he was one of her satisfied clients because she could groom his one quarter inch silver buzz cut to perfection. He was so grateful, he made her a barber pole out of colored Venetian blinds to advertise her services. Ruth was modest and she would later write that at first um, landing in Black Mountain, she felt like a country bumpkin among artists, but she thrived there and quickly made a name for herself through her nonstop work ethic and her artistic vision. Here in this watercolor, you can see both the influence of Joseph Albers' vibrant color studies and abstract forms suggesting dancers' bodies in motion, especially on the lower left. You can see a sort of abstracted dancer with her arms raised. And here's another one of Ruth's watercolors from Black Mountain, a study of leaves showing her embrace of both Albers' color vibration theory and transparency achieved with watercolor washes. Even while making her name an abstract sculpture, Ruth would always love botanical drawings and paintings throughout her whole career. I really love this poetic portrait of Ruth in the snow. One of the joys of being in art school was their proximity to the Blue Ridge Mountains with their lush forests and flowers. Students often went on hikes together. And one favorite destination was a spot known as the Garden of Eden, famous for romantic encounters. On one such walk, she bumped into a new architecture student from Georgia named Albert Lanier. He was swept away. As student sweethearts, he helped her with math and she gave him design advice on architectural projects. And from that sort of magical summer of 1948, they were very much a couple. Well, one thing led to another, and before leaving Black Mountain in 1949, Ruth and Albert knew they wanted to build a future together, in spite of laws banning interracial marriage and their parents' disapproval. So they asked for their professor's blessings. Ruth approached Joseph Albers, asking if she could become an artist and have a family with six babies. Albers said, yeah, yeah, you make babies. That is your art. Although the teacher later told her husband, Albert, never let her stop doing her work. For his part, Albert approached Buckminster Fuller, who wholeheartedly blessed their union, comparing it to the work of an oyster, creating a pearl around a grain of sand. Bucky designed Ruth's wedding ring from a river stone set amid silvered strands that look sort of like interlocking A's in Asawa. One of the surprises of my research and one of the greatest joys was getting to read and quote from the love letters of Ruth and Albert, thanks to the generosity of their family and sharing them. Well, just in time, the California Supreme Court caught up with the couple's plans and overturned the state law against intermarriage, allowing Ruth and Albert to get married without hitchhiking to Nevada. They exchanged their wedding vows before a small circle of family and friends in their artist loft in San Francisco. Ruth was very soon expecting their first child, but just before daughter Aiko arrived, shown here on Ruth's lap, Ruth heard about a baby boy needing a home. The couple adopted him and named him Xavier. He's shown here on Albert's lap. They created together a beautiful blended family and were very much trendsetters in building an inclusive home, decades ahead of the rest of society. Well, by the early 1950s, Ruth was deep into exploring all the possibilities of making sculpture by looping wire into a continuous tissue of mesh forms. This built upon a basic basket making technique she learned during her travels to Mexico, where she met local craftsmen. They were making simple baskets to take produce and eggs to the marketplace by coiling and looping wire. Ruth, when she got back to Black Mountain, had started expanding this technique for making utilitarian baskets into fashioning these long, sinuous forms, linking ovals and spheres and nested forms within forms. They were abstract and yet also suggested shapes from nature. Some people see the suggestion of gourds or vines or garlands of seaweed, 
Ruth herself liked to say that their transparency was like a dragonfly's wings. To me, the real magic of Ruth's art is that she transforms wire, an industrial material that was also, of course, used in the barbed wire fences that surrounded camp, into these shining mesh creations. At every turn, it seems, Asawa turned swords into plowshares and ugliness into beauty. Well, here's another form within a form sculpture, this one combining aluminum and brass for a sort of shimmering silver and gold effect. You can appreciate the sort of subtle colors of the different metals in the wires that she used if you visit the De Young Museum, where she has a gallery solely devoted to her work, and it's always free. Well, along with closed spheres and ovals and forms within forms, Ruth experimented with open work sculptures. And this actually originated from a mistake, a sort of accident, or a happy accident, if you will. The story goes she was forming a looped wire sculpture and made a mistake in the loops that couldn't be untangled. So she was forced to cut it open. And she discovered that instead of having to sacrifice the sculpture, the weight of the hanging piece actually opened up these sort of flaring or frilled edges. Ster serendipity actually played a big role in her inventions. This portrait by Imogen Cunningham shows Ruth intently focused on forming a looped wire sculpture with a coil of wire on the left. You can notice if you look really closely that the index finger of her right hand, right under her, her chin, is taped with masking tape to protect her fingers, which were always getting cut and scraped while she was sculpting. Those sculptures may look very delicate and diaphanous, but the material is super sharp. Here's another looped wire form within a form sculpture, her signature genre, which is lighted to show the shadow play that they create. You notice that most of her abstract sculptures are labeled untitled and S for sculpture with a number because she doesn't name them to suggest any particular narrative or theme. She leaves it to us, the viewers, to experience the art for ourselves. Asawa was mainly interested in seeing how far she could push the material or play with forms and use the wire, as she said, to draw in space. This portrait of Ruth at work on her back shows us the mammoth scale of some of these pieces, the longest one of which stretched to 21 feet long. If you look really closely, you can see the wedding ring by Buckminster Fuller on her left hand. This group portrait of Ruth at work is many people's favorite picture of her as it shows Ruth surrounded by her growing family. She chose very intentionally to make her studio at home so that there would be no walls between work and life or art and family. She actually turned down offers by a design firm wanting to hire her to provide her with nannies and housekeepers so that she could boost her output of sculpture because she wanted the pleasure of raising her own children. She also wanted her kids to see her at work and to appreciate the interconnection of work and life. And as you see here, Ruth actually isn't slumping in exhaustion, although she would have the right to be, she was so busy. She's working on a sculpture in progress. And if you look, you can see part of a sphere of looped wire just between her knees down by her tennis shoe. This installation shot shows Ruth seated amid a group of her hanging wire sculptures at the San Francisco Museum of Art, which is now called the SF MoMA. Asawa continued to loop wire well into the late 1990s when she was in her 70s, but she continually evolved and explored new forms, one of which comes up in the next slide. In 1963, she embraced a new challenge from her friend, the photographer, Paul Hassel. He had just returned from a trip to the desert with a spiky sort of tumbleweed looking plant. And he asked her if she thought she could draw it. But the structure of the radiating branches uh, was so dense and it was so complicated that she decided instead to render the form using wire. This experiment led to Ruth Asawa's tied wire sculptures as shown here. But Asawa also did some figurative representational sculpture. This fountain titled Andrea 
also known as her mermaid fountain, led to Ruth's nickname of San Francisco's Fountain Lady. It's the centerpiece of the courtyard at Ghirardelli Square on San Francisco's waterfront. The work's debut sparked a huge controversy because the lead architect for the square, Lawrence Halprin, wanted an abstract fountain. Ruth had a different vision, however, a seascape that would honor the city's coastline and appeal to young and old visitors alike. She depicts two mermaids, one as a nursing mother, surrounded by sea turtles, water lilies, and frogs. Halperin criticized the work as Disney-esque, but his attack on the fountain, if anything, made the piece even more popular with the public. Around this time, Asawa noticed that her kids coming home from school with ditto sheets to color um, an exercise that passed for art with busy, with, excuse me, with busy um, public school teachers um, really bothered her because she thought that this school system should be doing better. So she launched the Alvarado Arts Project, which grew from a summer school program in one elementary school to a year round citywide program and thus began her second great vocation as a public school arts advocate. Throughout her life and career, Asawa spoke very little about her camp years, but in the mid-90s, she decided to craft her story in bronze in this monumental work, the Japanese American Internment Memorial. Here is one detail of the five by 14 foot bronze wall, excuse me, depicting on one side, the pre-war Japanese American community, and on the other side, scenes of war, the camps, the famed 442nd Regimental Combat Team, and the Supreme Court fight that was waged by resistors. This is just one detail of the wall showing the guard towers, the barbed wire, and a small paper airplane flying over the barbed wire fence. So um, I hope that everyone actually has a chance to visit this sculptured wall since no one photograph can ever hope to capture it all. Asawa also incorporated other Japanese forms and themes into her sculptured fountain. And one such influence was the Japanese art of folded paper, of course. Ruth loved making origami and teaching it to students, both adults and children, all her life. Here she transformed the folds into stainless steel in a sunburst-shaped sculpture called Aurora for the goddess of the dawn. Facing the Embarcadero of San Francisco and the water and the Bay Bridge, it frames the rising sun over the East Bay Hills. This piece, which was installed around her 60th birthday, followed a battle with the disease lupus that she fought into remission before continuing this piece among many other projects. Well, here you can see Ruth and Albert, who divided their later years between their art and architecture and their advocacy for arts in the public schools. They launched what is now known as the Ruth Asawa San Francisco School of the Arts. They helped raise $150 million in bond funds to renovate a new home for the school downtown near the performing arts hub of the symphony, the ballet, and the opera. That was their great dream, but it proved to be a sort of great unfinished symphony in their life, and it still remains to be moved downtown. One secret hope I have is that my book might help reignite the movement to move the school to a new home. Here, they're shown pausing in their garden and having met in a garden, it's sort of poetic to me that they tended gardens together throughout their life. Well, I'll just close uh, this portion of our get together with a picture of this sculpture, which actually made art history for Ruth Asawa. Asawa's output throughout her 87 years was so prolific and her public service was so nonstop that it really staggers the imagination. The rebuilt de Young Museum featured Asawa in a solo retrospective in 2006, and her star has never dimmed in her adopted hometown of San Francisco. But in New York, where collectors had embraced Ruth in the late 1950s, her work began to fade from view. However, that was about to change, and there's a great story I get to tell in my book about how a chance phone call from the family to an auction house actually alerted a New York curator to rediscover Ruth Asawa. 
he recognized the neglected genius that she was, and he set out to relaunch her in the New York and world art markets. This particular sculpture, which is labeled S108, went up for auction in May of 2013 and set a record price of more than $1.4 million. Since then, her auction values have tripled to more than $4 million, and she's had one-woman exhibitions around the U.S. and Europe, with upcoming shows in Oxford, England, and in Norway, pending the reopenings from the COVID-19 pandemic. Next month, another honor is coming her way when the U.S. Postal Service will issue a commemorative stamp set depicting Asawa's sculptures. And finally, in today's turbulent world, world, I really just would make a personal comment that Asawa's model of sort of transcending injustice with art and love and public service continues to inspire me and I hope others. I feel very lucky for having had the chance to bring her story to new readers. Thanks to all of you for sharing your time with me. And now I'd be glad to any, answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Marilyn, for sharing so much of your work with us. And as you said, we will now transition into a live Q&A. <laughs> Hi, Marilyn. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Hey, Erin. <laughs> it's great to see you again uh, on a different platform. Um, so I wanted to start, I know there will be questions from the audience as well, but I wanted to start um, asking you a little bit about your process of coming to, to know Ruth and to write this book. Because one of my favorite parts about this biography is the way that Ruth's voice is so present throughout, whether it's in you know quotes from letters that she's writing as she's trying to get her father out of New Mexico to join the family or you know all throughout her life, um, her voice is just so present. So reading her biography, you feel like you get to know Ruth. Um, so I'm wondering how you yourself came to came to this project, what the research process was like for you, um, and then how you crafted this story, what you decided to to focus on and and highlight as as you put together this really incredible biography. Well, that's thanks for asking that question. There's kind of a lot to unpack there, so I'll try to <laughs> share the beginning. Um, the first thing that I got to do, I think, as uh, old habits from being a newspaper reporter is that you will always look at the documents first, right? Yeah. First the documents, then the interviews. And I felt so fortunate to have practically in my own backyard, um, just an hour's drive from San Francisco down at Stanford, these 275 boxes of her archives. And so um, I devoted myself to just going through every every letter, every document, every piece of paper. And I especially loved opening a box that would have um, these manila folders that would include her writings. Mm -hmm. um, she did a fair amount of public speaking, but it was in her writings where her personal sort of internal voice kind of came through. She um, occasionally did some um, autobiographical writing, some um, some sort of memoir style writing. And I just loved that because after you sort of sit with letters for a while and you read them and you take notes and you and you copy them and you come back and reread them, a, as you say, a voice starts to emerge. And I feel like I could sort of start hearing her, you know, kind of speaking. Um, of course, we also have access to videos where she is talking. So, so that helped as well. So the Stanford archive was my main document repository at first, but there was also incredible research um, primary source materials at the National Archives and Records Administration in Washington, DC, where, as I'm sure um, a lot of the participants in this month's virtual pilgrimages um, have already started exploring, um, you know, many, many, many thousands of people have files that are kept there and they're called, you know, in the bureaucratic language of the day, um, for example, the Ruth Asawa evacuee case file. And they're all given numbers. So if you if you um, file a request with the National Archives, you can get these case files. And they have all kinds of documents. When someone moved into one of the these, you know, sort of 
settings of incarceration, what sort of documents were filed, um, their medical examinations. And for young students, they were asked to write an autobiography. So um, I was wondering today in my mind, what purpose was served by the US government having an autobiography by a young teenager. Mm -hmm. And if you let your mind go, you can imagine all kinds of sort of mo motives for such a thing. But the beauty of it was um, Ruth is a teen. She's now 16, going on 17 years old, mm -hmm. wrote about her trip from Los Angeles to Arkansas. And, you know, riding across the country in this hot, crowded train and looking out the window and seeing the landscapes flying by and yeah. um, and and her thoughts on arriving in Arkansas, which were, of course, um, overwhelming, intimidating um, um, sort of visions opening up to her of the camp, um, the sort of um, grim barrack settlement. Um, and her kind of hopes um, for how she might make it inside. Those kinds of um, almost um, internal monologues could be found in some of the some of the research documents. So um, there was that Den Show Encyclopedia Online, another goldmine of scholarship. Um, lots of wonderful books have been written about the era, of course. Um, and, but it's also always the primary source documents that I love. Uh, the Roar Outpost, the Roar Reunion booklets, fabulous because a lot of the people who would go to reunions would contribute, you know, little reminiscences, little memoir pieces, little stories, either sad ones or funny ones about, you know, waiting in line in the mess hall and, you know, trying to get through it or, um, how to how to make it through the the baking hot summer of Arkansas or the or the snowy winters, and so you could get you know kind of a flavor for the context. Anyway, um, when I got my way through the documents and I felt like I had enough, mm -hmm. um, then I started doing interviews, and I interviewed uh, more than eighty of her family and friends and coworkers, as many as I could locate, and who had the patience to sit with me and. Put up with my question. The family was exceptionally gracious, of course, and I was super lucky to meet two of her Black Mountain College classmates, um, one of whom has since passed away, but um, Mary Parks Washington, an African-American um, maker of collages and other modern art uh, who lived in California until very recently when she passed away. Also, Susan Weil, a New York-based abstract painter who still maintains a studio in Brooklyn, had really fresh um, memories of, of meeting Ruth and admiring her work. Um, so um, the interview process was obviously um, a joy also. Yeah, and I, I love as you're outlining going through these primary sources, I mean, that's one of the things that I think so many of us value about these pilgrimages that we do. And, and Tadaima, this virtual pilgrimage we're doing is that you get to hear those little, you know, everyday stories that sometimes are not captured in the larger sweeping histories. Um, but it's, you know, it fills in, it colors in the lines and, and so many of the silences that end up woven into these histories. So there, your book is just filled, filled with those details and, um, it's, it's really wonderful. So along those lines, um, and you touched on this a bit in your presentation, I'm wondering if you could talk more about how Ruth's childhood on the farm and living through the depression and then her experiences of incarceration at Santa Anita and at Rower, um, how you saw that affecting her, her later life choices and her artistic choices as well. Well, growing up on the farm in the Depression, um, it was a very lean sort of existence. The family ate what they grew. Um, they um, It was a big family, nine people around the table. And I think Ruth's father, Umakichi Asawa, also ended up caring for his brother's children after his brother's illness and and um, untimely death. So he had a lot, of, a lot of mouths to feed, and they made the best of it. They had one chicken a week. Um, they, um, they, I think they got through on a quart of milk a day for cereal. Um, if somebody dropped a melon, a ripe melon, and it broke, that's what they ate. You know, they they made do. And her father was so thrifty. He had built their farmhouse by hand out of board and batten, and he never he never wasted anything. If he had an old nail that was bent. 
he would recycle it and strain it out and use it again. He made their toys, he made them little trucks and cars out of old sewing thread spools and rubber bands. And Ruth would also pick up that habit of recycling and reusing. So she tells a story about how she would unwind, you know, those old fashioned vegetable crates that had wire ties at the ends with these thin pieces of flexible wood. She would unwind the wire and make them into rings and bracelets. And she, if she found a red bead, she would put it on the ring and pretend it was a ruby. So you see the beginnings of her sense of, of conservation. And it's interesting to know that, you know, throughout her career, studying from uh, Joseph Albers at the Bauhaus, mm -hmm. Bauhaus believed in simple materials. Albers made beautiful stained glass pieces out of broken beer bottles. Um, and when Ruth started um, encouraging more arts education in San Francisco, she launched a group called Scrap. Uh, for Scroungers Center for Recycled Art Parts. <laughs> and they would just take like surplus paper and leather and fabric and you know even old CD jewel cases. Wow. And now there's a whole warehouse to this day, it's still in operation. Any teacher in San Francisco can go get free or low cost art supplies. So that habit of thrift, of, of conservation, of working with simple materials of never throwing anything away, um, stayed with her her whole life long and influenced her practice. Wow, that's amazing to hear about Scrap because it just reminds me so much of the story of her art teacher at Rower who found you know all these materials for them to use and advocated for um, the camp to provide more materials. It's really amazing how directly that you know, those lessons seem to stay with her. Um, that's incredible. So I have more questions, but we'll turn to some from, from folks who are watching along with us. So Steve Fujimura asks, what did Ruth Asawa's children think of her as an artist? Oh, I think that they revered her. Um, her art was, was and is um, really sacred to the family. However, I think, um, the kids told me, her kids told me um, that when they were growing up as teens, they did kind of um, rebel a little bit because their house didn't look like their friend's house. <laughs> Everything was handmade. Of course, now we think, oh my goodness, you know, she carved their front door. Right. Gorgeous. It's a gorgeous handcrafted double door uh, with these beautiful curving designs. And she let her kids have a hand. But, um, one of her kids said, oh, gee, mom, you know, why can't we have a front door like other people? Our house is so freaky because they wanted to, you know, part of them wanted to be like the other kids. And Iko tells a really hilarious story um, that growing up with the name Iko, which is her, her mother's Japanese name, um, which means love child. Um, she thought she wanted to be called Kathy or Linda or <laughs> some, you know, kind of white bread American name. Of course, now she realizes the, the treasure of her cultural heritage. Right. Back then, you know, her mom was always in the studio wearing, you know, jeans and paint spattered sweatshirts and you know, her mom wasn't, you know, she said she wanted a mom like June Cleaver, you know, vacuuming in a dress and high heels, which is, of oh. course, ridiculous. But it's what <laughs> you really think. And she said, now I really treasure those jeans and I've saved them and I've packed them away. So um, not only did do they um, all help to preserve and um, maintain her, her art treasures, but they also help, um, uh, they all have pieces at mm -hmm. home. Um, they help kind of um, do public speaking for her. Um, and they're all sort of creative people. They're artists, they're builders. Iko is a painter. Addie, her sister, uh, was a dancer and she's now, she's been a teacher. Uh, Hudson, Xavier, and Adam were um, builders and designers. And, um, and Paul, the youngest, is mm -hmm. a so the creative gene definitely gets passed along. And the grandchildren, the children of her children mm. are creative people, dancers, artists, actors. Um, and um, they all they all had wonderful stories to add to to the life of Ruth. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. That the front door story you tell is so funny because my grandmother was a beautiful knitter. So she made most of the sweaters my siblings and I wore growing up, growing up and for my dad and his brother. And my dad tells the story of when he was in like fourth or fifth grade saying, mom, I just want a sweater with a tag in it. 
<laughs> I just want to have one that, you know, looks like what the other kids have. And now, you know, we treasure those letters and I've inherited some from my mom. And yeah, so it's just kids. Exactly. You know? <laughs> Don't make homemade mac and cheese. I want, you know, craft out of the box. Right, right, right. Anyway. <laughs> Yeah, that classic kind of thing. Well, it's I guess we all have a little a little bit of that right. in our lives, but but the great thing is that they all um, grew up to kind of honor their artistic heritage. Right. Yeah, that is really cool. Um, and along those lines, I, I would love for you to talk more about Ruth's artistic process itself, and both you know mm -hmm. her decision to keep her studio at home, um, but also just the way that she that you understand her approaching her her art and her work throughout her life. Well, to, um, you know, I didn't have the benefit of seeing her sculpt and paint in action. I've seen videos of her at work. Um, but to hear her, her daughter and her colleagues describe it, she was just nonstop. She would work on several pieces at once, oftentimes. She'd be having a, a couple of sculptures going, uh, or maybe a, a few paintings going, or maybe be... Um, you know, molding some figures in baker's clay that would later be cast in bronze. And with the, with the family around, um, of course, uh, children would be needing lunch, the baby would be needing a bottle. She would just put down a sculpture, go make a meal uh, when dinner time rolled around. Um, she was used to feeding a crowd. It didn't phase her. She moved sort of smoothly from one thing to the next. Mm -hmm. She always set a table for a crowd. And she oftentimes had colleagues, artists, friends. Some of her coworkers in the school's programs would come drop by for dinner. After dinner, they would all sketch. They would sit around and sketch. And if there was a new baby in the family, they put the baby in the center of the table and they would sketch the baby. Um, she would also teach her friends to cook because she was a fantastic cook. Uh, just an amazing, creative, savory home cook. And um, she would teach her, she learned how to cook Southern style to please her husband, Albert Lanier, who came from Georgia. And even though she personally craved um, wonderful flavors of Japanese foods, she also had to make, you know, grits and gravy and fried chicken and um, spare ribs and, um, and, and that sort of thing. And so she would teach her her guests to make gravy or to make her famous salad dressing. So her kids tell great stories of missing their moms, their moms cooking. Uh, her son Hudson told me nobody has, they've all tried and no one can master her, her, uh, that wonderful sticky teriyaki sauce. And he also says, you know, everybody makes such a big deal now about farm to table cooking. He said, my mom was doing it back in the sixties, <laughs> long before the famous, you know, cult chefs were, were doing farm to table. So that was part of the process too. And it was all kind of this continuous, just part of the tissue of life, I guess. Um, and she did very much um, value and insist on having her studio at home um, where her kids could watch her and participate. And I'm sure they picked up many tips and learned to value the artistic process. Yeah. So um, about other things, you know, she um, she did sculpt um, for many, many decades, um, never really stopped. Um, she always loved painting. She loved painting botanicals. It's sort of less well known, but in some of her the exhibition catalogs, if you get a chance to see her botanical watercolors, they're just gorgeous. They're glorious. Um, and um, she was always um, trying out new forms, tied wire. Um, when she had, um, when all of her kids were um, in school, were born and in school, yeah. he took a fellowship in learning lithography and learned the art of, you know, sort of um, working on stone. So um, always learning, always evolving. Yeah. Wow. And a woman ahead of her time in so many ways and so many aspects of her life. But that's really incredible. And, and to think of, you know, that she wanted to have her art and her home and her family and just herself, all of those parts connected and, and in one place is, is wonderful and so reflected in, in the art that she does and the stories that you tell about her, too. Um, I do want to talk about the the memorial in San Jose. Um because I've never seen it in person. I know some, I'm jealous of Mia Russell who comments that she, she saw it back in February. Um, but I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how that process came to be for Ruth and, and what it was um, that kind of spurred that on in that particular moment. I have some ideas, but 
Um, and just tell us a little bit more about, about that, that wall and, and its role and function as a memorial. Right. Well, as you probably um, know far better than I, um, when the, uh, the reparations movement started um, and the formal apology was um, sent out to all the survivors um, from the president of the United States, um, part of the government's response um, was to create funds for education and for artworks. And there was just this kind of general, um, it was just in the air that people wanted to devote funding and um, local governments were incorporating um, educational units in the public school programs and all of these things were happening in the mid to late 80s and the 90s. So the city of San Jose um, put out a request for mm -hmm. proposals for a monument to honor the Japanese American community of the Santa Clara Valley, the San Jose area, which is you know in the heart of Silicon Valley. And Ruth competed and she won the commission. And this was a public commission. So she designed, she submitted designs. And of course it was a mammoth uh, project that she um, proposed, um, a five foot tall by 14 foot wide bronze wall, double-sided. Um, it's actually more than double-sided, although they're the two main sides with the pre-war community and the, and the war years. Um, the ends are also decorated. There's not a surface that isn't beautiful. The ends are decorated with, um, with important symbols from the culture, um, pine bough, plum branches, bamboo, you know, the sort of symbols for loyalty and springtime and for um, longevity and um, on the, the moan, the family crests. She did tremendous research. She and her daughter, Addie, um, surveyed the whole community in the San Jose area and sent out letters asking families to, if they knew their family crest to please send it in. Wow. And they um, confirmed and verified all these family crests. And so you see family crests of all the families. So it's very much uh, representative of the local Japanese American community. Then when it came to sort of designing the, the sort of the tableau, the scenes that they were going to incorporate, um, Ruth got together with her youngest son, Paul, who, as I mentioned, is a, a maker of ceramic art. And one of her, um, her fellow artists in the, in the San Francisco area, Nancy Thompson. And together they made, you know, from, from sketches to larger drafts to, to full scale plans, they decided the scenes they wanted to incorporate. And there were so many. One of the amazing things about this work is the, the compression um, that she did. You know, there's, there's, it's really sort of a history of the, of the era in art mm. and kind of weaves it all in so seamlessly. It's just uh, kind of a miracle. But um, they first sculpted the original uh, forms in, um, you know, there were sort of different segments and they made the forms using this simple recipe for what she called baker's clay. And it's in the book. It's a certain proportion of, you know, you take four cups of flour, a certain amount of water, a certain amount of salt, and then you knead it together. And then you can, you can it's malleable. You can make figurines out of it and set them in a, a background. And then you can, you can harden it. If it's small, you can bake it in your oven for a school project. If it's large, you know, if it's five by 14 feet or in segments, they had to put it under heat lamps. After that was done, they then cast it in bronze using the lost wax process. And um, I actually got to interview the bronze craftsman who worked with her at uh, the bronze foundry in Berkeley. And it was just incredible. Ruth um, kind of um, fell in love with the whole process of bronze casting because it's, it's very dangerous. Um, it's very beautiful. The foundry uh, workers will heat up the bronze into a liquid, you know, red hot form. And then they have to wear these fireproof suits and they, they carry the crucibles around on poles. And they do this It's almost very, it has to be choreographed because it's so dangerous. Mm -hmm. And they call it the dance of the poor. And they actually do this, they do demonstrations sometimes at night. So you can see nothing but this kind of like waterfall of molten bronze. And they bit by bit, they mold and then they they do what's called chasing the bronze. They you know they they buff off the little imperfections and then they um, 
they um, put the patina on that gives it that rich um, kind of golden brown color. And it's, um, it's just a gorgeous process to watch and to learn about. It's a very ancient process, thousands of years old, uh, the lost uh, wax process. So Ruth loved that. She was all at the foundry, hanging out with the foundry workers. She'd cook for them, that of course, being Ruth, she'd cook for them. She'd have them to the house. They loved her. She loved them. And um, the bronze, the the owner of the bronze foundry just said he would do anything for Ruth. He's an Italian uh, born craftsman. He would do anything for Ruth oh, okay. because she was so humble about her art mm -hmm. and she always gave credit to the craftsman who executed the piece. So yeah, start to finish, it was just a beautiful story. And um, on the day they dedicated it, um, one of the um, honored attendees among the thousand hundreds and thousands of people who descended on San Jose was Fred Korematsu, the famous resistor who fought um, Executive Order 9066 all the way to the Supreme Court. And there are photos of them together kind of celebrating if you go to the archive. Oh, wow. That's incredible. And you you point out in your presentation the paper airplane in the corner of that photo. And can you tell the story behind that as well? Yeah, well, um, it was kind of a surprise to me um, because I learned that the, the paper airplane sailing over the barbed wire to freedom was kind of a last minute addition to the tableau of pictures. And um, it wasn't as I as I imagined. I imagined that this is something maybe Ruth herself did as a young teen, you know, like making paper airplanes and and sailing them over the fence. But um, it turned out that um, a photographer that Ruth knew named Terry Schmidt, I believe it was Terry, who was coming to the foundry to take pictures of the process to document the creation of the wall. Yeah. And while he was in his car from San Francisco to Berkeley, he was he heard an interview um, on the radio. I don't know if it was around the time of the Days of Remembrance or what the, the reason was for the interview, but there were some gentlemen who were camp survivors telling stories. And they said, yeah, remember how we used to make paper airplanes and sail them over the fence? So when Terry arrived at the foundry to talk to Ruth and the coworkers, you know, Paul Lanier, her son, and Nancy Thompson, her coworker, he said, stop, you've got to put this new thing you have to you have to incorporate this design element i just heard about these men were talking about how they used to make paper airplanes and sail them over the fence so there's actually a journal that they kept of the making of this wall and um we're so lucky to have that nancy thompson wrote well we have to incorporate a new element in the design so the paper airplane is now part of the wall okay. so um they were they were open-minded and they kept making changes and additions. And it was really difficult because it's so huge and it had to be done in pieces. Right. Um, but yeah. Wow. It's amazing the amount of, of community input that really, it seems like she's, you know, saw this as such a community project and gift and how much input and thought she incorporated is incredible. Um, mm -hmm. I also, I want to ask, cause I know there was a question earlier about where her work can be seen. Um, I know you mentioned a few places in your presentation, um, and Thomas Kurahara also asks, is any of Ruth's artwork included in, in the McGeehy Museum near the former um, rower site? There is um, there is a, um, a museum in um, Little Rock okay. that has some of Ruth's work. Yes, Arkansas does have some of um, Ruth's work. Um, I believe that the bulk of it, I know um, Miss Rosalie Gould, who was the former mayor um, of Roar, um, kind of had a fight with some of the, some of the locals. Um, and she had a collection of artifacts from Roar, um, but she wanted, they wanted to rename some streets or some city, um, city landmarks after folks in the camps. And she ran into some opposition by some of the uh, some of the local folks, and she got she got mad, and she moved her museum somewhere else. <laughs> she said they'll never have my work, and I don't know whether that some of those artifacts have been spread out now or not. Um, but yes, there are there are works of art um, um, pieces from um, from the camps in the museums. Um, I hope that um, some of the, the folks who are listening in also can have access to um, the Art of Gaman by Delphine Hirasuna because Delphine went beyond Roar um, 
to um, all the camps and asked people if they had things in their garage that their aunts and uncles, their grandparents, their parents had made or brought back. Um, and so she eventually turned this into um, a traveling exhibit that went to the Smithsonian Institution and became a book, The Art of Gaman. Uh, by Delphine Hirasuna. And it's just wonderful because it shows um, how much creativity was really present in all of the camps yeah. and how people made incredible furniture, sculpture, artwork, jewelry. Um, and it all started because Delphine was rooting around in her parents' garage and found a little bird pin. And she said to her mother, mom, where did this come from? And out came these stories, and from that she built her exhibition. Wow. So that's um, that's something to see too. But yeah. as for other places where a Ruth sculpture is, there are pieces in New York um, for anybody from the from the East Coast. <laughs> um, there's um, there are pieces in the in the collections of many museums. There's a beautiful big hanging at the Whitney, the new Whitney Museum of American Art in Lower Manhattan. Um, there is a, a piece, um, a, a museum in Texas has recently acquired some works. Um, San Francisco has, of course, the mother load of all right. uh, <laughs> uh, sculptures in the de Young Museum and also around town. There are many fountains and public pieces. The Mermaid Fountain, there's the Hyatt Union Square Fountain near the Big Apple Store in Union Square. That's the one where she invited the community to come in and help her make scenes of San Francisco. Um, there is even a hotel that commissioned um, a series of panels on California history. It was called the Ramada Renaissance, but it's now the Park 55, um, where you can see Asala's work. Um, she did um, a plaque in the Japanese tea garden in San Francisco's Golden Gate Park. Oh. Um, honor the Hagiwara family that created and tended that garden for many years and then um, was was caught up in the incarceration and then after great difficulty in many years came back. Um, so she was kind of spearheading. She helped spearhead not only the plaque and the recognition but the renaming of the street that runs in front of the de Young and the tea garden, um, Hagiwara um, Boulevard. So um, She's her her fingerprints are are everywhere, and as I say, um, more and more shows are going up in Europe. And um, thanks to this um, specialist in contemporary and post-war art, Jonathan Leib, who's now with the David Werner Gallery, um, it's a big mega gallery that has offices and sites in New York and all over the world. Um, they also represent Yayoi Kusama, so um, and the Joseph Albers estate. So a lot of cultural sort of cross fertilization is going on. Wow. Well, I could talk to you for so much longer, but we are unfortunately out of time. Um, so I want to thank you so much, Marilyn, for being here and for talking about this beautiful book, which I recommend all of you, um, if you haven't, pick up a copy or donate to Den Show and maybe receive a copy. Um, thank you, Marilyn, so much for being here. It's been really wonderful to talk with you and, and hear more about this book and this really incredible artist. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thank you so much for including me today. Thanks to folks for listening in. And if anybody has any questions that come to mind later, you can always um, shoot me an email through my website, MarilynChase.com. And if... Um, if there, you have any more specific questions about where her art is located, maybe I can send you, you know, a private email and name some of those other museums that you can um, consult. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you, Kimiko Mar and Roy Starazio in the back. Thank you to Mia and Hanako for organizing this book club. Um, I will encourage you all to go watch the artist talk that's about to begin in just about a minute. Um, and also tomorrow we have an added live session at 11 a.m. Pacific time that is called Hamil Asians. And it's featuring five Asian Americans who've been involved with Hamilton, in Hamilton, directing Hamilton, um, moderated by Brooke Ishibashi. So please join in tomorrow. And thank you so much again, Marilyn, for being here. Thank you. My pleasure.